And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Secretary of State John Kerry landed in Geneva, Switzerland today to clinch a nuclear deal with Iran. He was invited there by European Foreign Policy Minister Catherine Ashton to close the differences between world powers and Iran. Mr. Kerry flew to Geneva from Tel Aviv, where he held a very tense meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In addition to Mr. Kerry, UK Foreign Minister William Haig, French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabus, and German Foreign Foreign Minister Guido Vestavella also arrived in Geneva today, adding to the speculation that a big deal will be announced very soon. London and Jerusalem news outlets have reported all week that the deal will provide Iran with a lucrative cash incentive to promise to bargain in good faith with the West to arrive at a comprehensive agreement within six months. Does that make sense? From what I'm understanding... The United States and the Western nations are going to reward Iran with money if Iran promises that it will bargain over the next six months in good faith to come up with an agreement. London's Telegraph reported that the Obama administration offered Iran a plan that would permit Tehran to continue enriching uranium at low levels during the six-month period. The newspaper said the U.S. would relax economic sanctions on Iran. The DailyBeast.com, however, reported that President Obama secretly lifted the sanctions last June after the election of Hassan Rouhani as Iran's new president. Now, if this proves to be true, The claim directly contradicts the assurances made by the White House and the U.S. State Department that the U.S. is strictly enforcing the economic sanctions on Iran even to this day. So the Daily Beast is saying that Mr. O canceled the sanctions last June. But, I mean, we all know Obama would never lie. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appears to be very angry and frustrated with President Obama. The Israeli leader called it a very bad deal and that Israel utterly rejects it. The Prime Minister also noted that his country is not obligated to honor any agreement that Mr. O and the Western nations make with Iran. I think you get the drift of where that's going. Mr. Netanyahu said that Iran is getting the deal of the century because they got everything and paid nothing. Meanwhile, Iranian state television broadcast a one-hour documentary that included a computer-animated video that showed Iranian missiles striking Israel. The targets in the video included Israel's Domona nuclear facility, the Israeli Defense Force headquarters in Tel Aviv, various uh, Israeli Air Force bases, a Tel Aviv bank on Rothschild Boulevard, a Tel Aviv shopping mall, and the Ben-Gurion International Airport. It's been quite a week for countries showing videos of of attacks. Last week, China was showing video 
on uh, China Central Television of how they're going to nuke American cities. This week, it's Iran showing videos of how they're going to nuke Israeli cities. You'd almost get the uh, feeling that World War III is ready to start. And, you know, if you were living in the Philippines, you'd probably think uh, it was the end of the world. Typhoon Haiyan is uh, ripping across the Philippines today, leaving a trail of destruction along its path. As it approached the islands last night, weather forecasters were astonished at the storm's size and strength. At its peak strength, the typhoon was described as off the charts, the largest a most powerful storm in recorded human history. I mean, they're saying that it, it made Katrina look like a weak sister. As it approached land, sustained winds were at 199 miles per hour. 750,000 people evacuated. All right, heads up. Next week, the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, the FBI, the National Guard, and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, known as NERC, will conduct a two-day national drill of America's electric grid. The purpose of Grid X2 is to probe the current state of preparedness for a major cyber attack on the country's electrical power system. Participants will operate from their usual workstations to simulate the response to a disruptive, coordinated physical and cyber event. Now, a spokesperson for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation said the drill will not go live and there will not be any planned blackouts in the United States. Simultaneously, hundreds of Chinese PLA soldiers will be in Hawaii, on the same days, participating in a drill with the U.S. Army. Chinese soldiers will be working with American soldiers to provide humanitarian assistance to an unknown country during a national disaster. This will be the first time Chinese PLA troops will be training on U.S. soil alongside American soldiers. If you recall, last year, Russian Spetsnaz commandos trained in Colorado with American Special Forces. Well, let's take a break. When I return, Richard Dorflinger from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops will tell us how Obamacare threatens the religious liberties of all Americans. And later in the program, South Carolina physician Dr. Mike Vososky will tell us how he's opting out of the entire system. This is True News. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the end time newscast. God's Word is clear. He loves you, and He's ready to help you answer His calling. Here's today's Moment with Charles Stanley. You see, you do not know what your potential is. Don't look back at your past and say, well, back yonder I made this mistake, so did they. Well, back yonder I did this, so did they. The issue is, are you willing to line up today with the will of God in your life and discover what He can do, what He will do, You say, well, I don't know that God loves me all that much. Yes, he does. That is your thinking. You can never prove that with the Word of God. What you have to ask is, what does the Word of God say? And the Word of God says very clearly that from God's perspective, what has he done? He has made you wonderfully and skillfully. That is, he hasn't left anything out. It's all there. Everything's there. Lining up with God's will begins with acknowledging who he is. Learn more in the Go Deeper section on our website, intouch.org. You're listening to True News, your Christian alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. Sixteen panic-stricken Senate Democrats met with Barry Sotoro yesterday at the White House. All of them are facing tough re-election campaigns in 2014. A total of 20 Senate Democrats are up for re-election next year. If Republicans keep all of their seats and win six Democratic seats, the Senate will swing over to the Republicans for the final two years of Barry Satoro's imperial presidency. The nervous Dems reportedly informed 
El Presidente Obama that they will not go to the altar to be sacrificed on behalf of Obamacare. The Obama administration spent almost a billion dollars of U.S. tax money on the healthcare.gov website, and it doesn't work. The website may never work. Even worse, an estimated 12 million people will be notified before the end of the year that their current health care plan will be canceled in order for the insurers to be compliant with Obamacare mandates. The Democratic senators know that their Republican opponents will pummel them with TV ads next year showing Barry Sotoro repeating over and over his big lie, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. The situation was so bad yesterday that the Marxist revolutionary in the White House had to call in his obedient lapdogs at MSNBC to broadcast a pathetic apology. Now, Barry didn't apologize for lying. He merely apologized to the people who believed his lie. He said he's sorry that so many people have lost their health care plan because they believed what he said. This guy is truly a narcissistic, mentally ill, pathological liar who either doesn't know the difference between truth and lies or has no remorse about brazenly lying and being caught at it. Of course, that is a mark of a true Marxist communist. Ironically, it appears that Mr. Obama has deliberately deceived America's ally Israel and has snookered Mr. Netanyahu to believe Mr. Obama's repeated assurances that he would not allow Iran to build nuclear programs. As I reported earlier in this program, Mr. Obama will allow Iran to continue enriching uranium. Therefore, if the Iranians like their nukes, they can keep their nukes. But the American people can't keep their health care plans. On Tuesday, Mr. and Mrs. Obama held a Hindu Diwali ritual in the White House to honor a false goddess. Michelle Obama said she and Barry want to embrace all faiths. Of course, all faiths doesn't mean the Christian faith. The Obamanistas are systematically purging the U.S. military of Christians, and they are relentlessly persecuting Christian churches, organizations, and ministries who object to Obamacare mandates that violate their religious beliefs. One man on the front line of this battle for religious liberty is Mr. Richard Dorflinger. He is a deputy director of the Secretariat for Pro-Life Activities of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He is also adjunct fellow in bioethics and public policy at the National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia. He's on the phone right now. Mr. Dorflinger, welcome to True News. Thank you very much. Well, I think you can tell by my introduction I have um, pointed views uh, rega- <laughs> regarding regarding what's going on in the White House. Um, it is quite amazing to stand back and just watch this take place, the lying, the deception, the cover-up, the lying about the lying, and and then his supporters denying that he lied. Hmm. Um, I mean, we could do a whole program about about the sin, you know, I mean, a person that's, that's caught up in this sin of lying. Uh, but we do have a man that, that repeatedly told the American people, a big lie. And it wasn't that he misspoke one time and his critics are trying to, you know, catch him in a mistake. He repeated the same statement. He didn't even vary the words. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. And now at least 12 million Americans have discovered that's a big fat lie. Now, regarding religious liberty, you you have been at the forefront of this fight uh, because Obamacare is a direct assault on religious liberty in this country. Most of our audience knows what's going on with this uh, battle, but take a few minutes and and recap what is in the Obamacare bill that every Christian should be alarmed about and should be doing something to stop it. Hmm, okay. Uh, and, you know, my organization, the Bishop's Conference, is – uh, would have a different perspective from some religious organizations on this because we were actually uh, hoping for a health care bill that would uh, increase people's access to health care. Uh, we didn't think that the top priority there was um, 
you know, sort of tinkering with the coverage people already had, but but with getting basic coverage for people who have none at all, which continues to be a big problem. But one of the things we were hoping was that people would be able to keep their rights of conscience and their religious freedom. And in the past, uh, there have been government programs that have that have included uh, 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 contraception, sterilization, uh, abortion to some degree. But always, always there's been uh, respect for people who disagree with any of those things. There's a, there's a contraceptive mandate for federal employees' health insurance, but it had a religious exemption, a very broad one. Uh, there's been... Uh, uh, you know, Medicaid, for example, Medicare has been, you know, the laws passed to say no provider has to provide, for example, uh, abortions that are against its beliefs in order to participate in the Medicaid program fully. So that's what we were hoping for with regard to this program, but that's not been the case. There's, uh, there isn't strong conscience protection in the law, and in particular, you have this regulation passed under the health care law that says Almost every health plan in America has to include uh, a full range of FDA-approved contraceptives, sterilization, and even some drugs that really cause a very early abortion in the first week after the, uh, the new embryo is fertilized. And the exemption for religious groups is an incredibly narrow exemption that really just covers churches themselves, houses of worship, and so on. So you have the broad range of uh, religious institutions, schools, colleges, uh, charitable institutions, and so on, hospitals that are not covered by that exemption and fall under this mandate. And it doesn't matter whether you as an individual, or as an employee, or as an individual buying insurance have a religious or moral objection to any of those things either. You have no opt-out as an individual or as an organization. So, so if, if a church... Um, a, a church is exempt. A church does not have to abide by this mandate. But if there is a let's say a Catholic hospital or a Baptist hospital, Presbyterian hospital, the hospital has to obey by it. Yeah, I mean, even the uh, the, the Southern Baptist Convention's own uh, health benefits plan that has been offered to a wide range of Baptist uh, you know, churches and, and organizations, charitable groups. Uh, is has now joined the lawsuits against this, saying our own clients are not going to be covered by this, and so we're going to be called upon to violate our conscience in uh, providing these things, uh, particularly in, the, in regard to most of the Protestant groups, particularly these early abortifacient drugs. Now, help me, because uh, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm accurate about this. If, if a church, which is exempt, mm-hmm. decides to offer health care plans to their employees, the pastor and the various employees of the church, does that automatically require them to offer a plan that is Obamacare compliant? Well, it has to comply with other requirements. It it does not have to comply with the contraceptive mandate if that's against their religious beliefs. But they would have, have, have to be compliant with all the other mandates. With the other mandate that they don't have, you know... You could have, you know, you have to have the essential benefits and so on, unless you have a specific religious objection to that particular procedure. But here's here's the real uh, here's the real uh, brain twister. Uh, if you are uh, below 50 employees and you're an employer, you don't have to offer any health care at all. Uh, but if you do offer a health plan. You, out of the goodness of your heart, you volunteer as a small employer to subsidize health care for your employees. You've got to put these things in, or you will be uh, having to pay $100 a day per employee, $36,500 a year per employee as a fine for offering a wonderful health plan that doesn't happen to sterilize your employees. Or if you are a larger employer... Uh, over the following, over the coming year, President Obama has said we're going to suspend the employer mandate. You don't have to offer any health care at all. You will not be penalized for offering nothing. You will only be penalized thirty-six thousand a year per employee if you offer a wonderful health plan, but don't offer an abortifacient drug because it violates your religion. That makes no sense at all. This is in a, in a law that is supposed to be increasing people's access 
to health care. Richard, what, what about if, if a church that is exempt mm-hmm. decides we're not going to – we're not going to offer anything. Uh, we're, we're just going to leave this alone. Then mm-hmm. the individual employees are now obligated on their own to purchase Obamacare. Is that correct? Well, that's right. The individual mandate still applies. Everybody is being told to purchase health insurance of some kind uh, that fulfills the requirements, uh, or they'll start to get fined. The, the tax for not doing so in the first year is not much. It goes up after that. It might only be $100 the first year and go up to $700 after a few years. And are those contraceptive mandates, are they in the individual plans also? They are in all the individual plans. So if a priest or a pastor who does not have coverage through his church says, okay, I'm going to comply with the law, he would have to buy a plan that pr- that provides for contraceptive services. There, that's right. There is no exemption for individuals, no matter how devout they are. And the kinds of employers and organizations that are that are covered by the mandate, uh, just to illustrate that, one of the most recent plaintiffs in these lawsuits, you know, saying you can't violate our religious freedom, is a, uh, a very devout religious order, a Catholic religious order, called the Little Sisters of the Poor. Now, these sisters are very prayerful people, but they provide services to the poor elderly, and they run nursing homes and uh, homes of care, and so they are not just a church. They don't only pray, they help people, and because they help people, they are not exempt, they are covered by the mandate. Because they're helping people? Yes, that's not religion. Oh, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, uh, James, James, what did James say was true religion? <laughs> it's, uh has something to do with helping your brother in need, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, widows yeah, and orphans is, in their affliction. Yes, this is, uh, this is sort of a crazy thing. You have a, an administration whose lawyers, whose Justice Department, have sort of taken, well, they've taken a lot of pages from the book of the American Civil Liberties Union and its view of religion. And that, first of all, uh, religion, freedom of religion is only freedom of worship. There's no freedom to act on your religion in in your public life and in uh, the business world and so on. This whole first round of lawsuits that are coming forward in the courts now are uh, for-profit companies owned by devout Christians of various kinds, Protestants and Catholics, who say, we want to be able to run a company, and we, we offer excellent health care to our employees. We want to be willing to run a company without violating our religious beliefs. And our employees are fine with that. They're not objecting to this. We just want to be able to offer a health plan that doesn't violate our religion. And they're having to go to court. And the Justice Department is saying, if you're in business, you're not allowed religious freedom. Do do, do you notice how the terminology is changing from freedom of religion to freedom of worship? That's a very dangerous thing. It's a very restrictive thing. It's... uh, most people it's, don't understand you know, the difference, but what they're doing is that they're taking away the concept of, of overall freedom of religion, and they're saying freedom of worship, and they're saying, basically, you have a right to your views and your mind, you have, you have a right to your religious practices in your home, but you have no right in the public arena. Yeah, we'd have to rewrite the New Testament to say, only those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but not those who do the will of my heavenly Father. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's, it, this is not the Christian understanding of religion. Well, Hitler, so Hitler uh, tried to change the gospel. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, they, they, the, the Nazis were rewriting the Bible. They, they created their own religion. Well, and this is the, you know, the, and I had never thought, uh, since I work on pro-life issues, and I never thought I'd see the Supreme Court as a great ally on my issues, but uh, one of its most recent decisions, which is a 9-0 to zero decision, upholding the religious freedom rights of a, uh, of a uh, Christian uh, school, uh, the uh, Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts, said something very interesting. He said, throughout our history, religion, religious organizations have been a vitally important mediating institution that helps to buffer between the individual and the state, so that individuals are not just exposed to the power of government without recourse. And that's why freedom of religion is so important, because these institutions, these communities of faith, are uh, communities in which people can band together 
to stand up for their rights and live in accord with the values they hold. And that's what's being knocked down here. We're talking about a notion of religion that does not allow for communities to get together and live by their values, because the government has its own idea of what's important. It's going to impose that on almost uh, almost all these religious institutions. Richard, if, if the Congress does not correct this situation, and if the courts do not rule in favor of Christians, mm-hmm. what will be the immediate consequence uh, among Catholic organizations going into 2014, 2015, as Obamacare takes effect? Well, those institutions are going to face a, a really terrible sort of Hobson's choice, because either they will have to stop offering health care, and then their employees just go on to these exchanges and buy individual plans that will have all this objectionable stuff anyway, or uh, or they stop serving the needy and uh, resort to uh, becoming uh, religious organizations in the very narrow sense of prayer and worship, but not action. Uh, or they or they will be hit with these punitive fines. Uh, our hope is that I mean, the, the the court cases, frankly, are going pretty well. Uh, of the, there are 38 lawsuits now in which uh, organizations have tried to get a preliminary injunction against the mandate. 38 of those, and 32 of them have succeeded in getting an injunction. Six have failed. Uh, ultimately, this is going to go to the Supreme Court. It's going there now. There are three appeals court decisions on it on their way. And uh, we hope the court will stand up for the First Amendment and uh, the rights that people have under the federal uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Are we approaching the day when priests and pastors are going to go to jail in America? This could be. Uh, I think I think the first uh, the first round will be uh, making it financially impossible for you to to practice uh, uh, and and run your organization, though, because initially, at least, all these penalties are. Uh, are penalties that will be imposed through the tax code. You'll just find that you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars in taxes that you can't afford. Did, did the did the National Catholic um, or the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, did, did they endorse Obamacare before its passage? No, what we did was uh, we were calling for the government to take steps to uh, to try to get closer to universal coverage in health care, to, uh, to get basic health care coverage for those who don't have it, in accord with certain moral principles. And the principles were respect for life, uh, born and unborn, uh, respect for conscience, and religious freedom. And we also wanted them to uh, do something for health care for uh, immigrants. Uh, the end up, you know, the, the final bill did not live up to any of the three in our view. So we ended up opposing the bill on final passage. And since it passed in 2010, we've been working very hard with others to try to fix the problems that are there. Do you think this current mess with the healthcare.gov website and Mr. Obama's brazen lying about people keeping their plans, do you think this is going to force the Congress to make changes, or are they just going to push on and, and ignore the facts? Well, I think, I mean, the House House of Representatives has been prepared to make changes or even to scuttle the bill altogether for a long time. They tried to get changes made uh, by, uh, by putting, uh, you know, language into the continuing resolutions to keep the government operating. The Democratic-controlled Senate just kept saying, uh, no, no and uh, rejecting all of those. I don't know whether that, that dynamic might now shift. They have to have another discussion in January about keeping the government funded and whether the Senate might accept at least some kind of uh, incremental change. The bill has now been introduced that's, that uh, the sponsor says will allow people to keep their plans if they like them. Uh, and uh, there are other things, too, including... And this was one of the things that was offered back in uh, uh, late September was a simply a sentence that would have suspended the contraceptive mandate from being uh, imposed on anyone who had a moral or religious objection for one year, just a one-year suspension to let the courts have their say on whether this violates religious freedom. The Senate rejected that as well. So you know, right now what would have to change is the attitude on the Senate side 
to showing that it's going to uh, address some of these problems that are emerging more and more. And with 20 Democrats up for re-election in 2014, and they're becoming nervous, I would not be surprised that they suddenly have a change of heart and pass a, a bill delaying Obamacare by one year, which would be after the election. Hmm. So they get back in to power, and then they start the whole process over again. <laughs> Well, that's a possibility. No, yeah, well, it's Washington. It's uh, politics, uh, yeah. you know. Hey, yeah. one la- one last question before I let you go. Um, the U.S. Senate passed ENDA last yes. night. What's your thoughts about that bill? Uh, we had we had asked the Senate uh, not to approve the bill. Uh, we think it does not have sufficient protection for religious freedom, and we think it does not it does not really make the distinctions that are needed between. Uh, orientation and activity. Uh, You know, it's one thing to say you can't discriminate against people because of their sexual orientation, who they're attracted to. Uh, We actually believe in that proposition. You should not discriminate against people. But uh, religious institutions, and not only religious institutions, want to be able to say there there are norms of acceptable behavior. And that's not something that ordinarily uh you know, we've been uh, prevented from doing is to keep school teachers, for example, from teaching the wrong messages to uh, kids by their example and their and their words. And so, uh, you know, the bill is just. You know, the bill the bill makes it a crime, makes it a federal crime if you discriminate against a cross dresser. So, if if you're a Christian business owner and one of your employees, if you, a male, shows up in high heels and lipstick. You, you can't tell him to go home because the law says the cross-dressing is permitted as long as it's as long as it's good grooming standards. So, you know, <laughs> if if the if the if the drag queen has his wig on correct and his lipstick on right, you can't send the person home. Yeah, it's we, we just we just felt the, Did, does this the seem, legislation was just too broad for, uh, you know, Richard, does this see Richard, does it start to look to you that America's turning into Babylon? Hmm. Well, I think uh, the culture has shifted in some wrong directions, and I think, you know, the government is doing very little to reverse that and sometimes is putting its finger on the scales in favor. So we aren't Babylon yet, but uh, there's certainly a need for Christians to pay attention to what's going on. All right. Well, my guest, uh, Mr. Richard Dorflinger, and uh, he's Deputy Director of the Secretariat for Pro-Life Activities, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming by today. Okay, thank you. A lot of doctors have told me privately they plan to retire or close their office or radically change the way they provide health care services to their patients. In the state of New York alone, There is a shortage right now of 1,100 primary care doctors, and the American Association of Medical Colleges estimates that by the year 2020, America will have a shortage of 91,500 doctors. Obamacare is eight weeks away. How are some doctors reacting to the deadline? Well, one doctor is simply opting out of the system, and he has started notifying his patients that he will run his office differently. Dr. Mike Fasovsky is a general physician in Aiken, South Carolina, and uh, he is on the phone right now to tell us how he is adjusting to Obamacare. Doctor, welcome to True News. Rick, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to talk. And uh, your introduction was uh, was spellbinding, and it was tack-on accurate. I uh, really appreciate your courage in using the word fascism. Uh, people <clears throat> might have to look that word up to understand what it means, but it truly is government and industry colluding uh, for the benefit of the industry. Another way of calling that, another word for that is crony capitalism. That's right. And uh, what people don't uh, realize when they say Obamacare, they're really talking about an insurance profit protection plan. Um, Obamacare was written by one woman. Her name was Liz. Is Liz Fowler? She was the former vice president of uh, insurance at WellPoint, California. She worked in Senator Max Baucus's office, where she almost single-handedly wrote the bill that became known as Obamacare. 
And who is she? Uh, and what so is her background? Her background, she's an attorney. She worked in the insurance, uh, health insurance industry, went to work in his office, wrote the bill, and from there was uh, taken to the White House to implement the bill. And in your introduction, you said uh, you've got to pass the bill to find out what's in it. Now, I think that's an oversimplification, but uh, it's something that people could understand. And the, the way it happens is that the bill is written, but it's in the implementation, it's in the writing of the regulations that these things play out. And that's why the bill has to be passed, so that the bureaucrats, some call the fourth uh, arm of government, step in and write the rules and regulations that make the thing take effect and how it's going to operate. The general ideas are laid out in the bill, but the details are worked out later on. In any case, Liz Fowler went to the White House, worked on the implementation of the whole thing, and now she's returned back to the health care industry, and I believe it's uh, Johnson & Johnson that she's working for. Do you believe Barack Obama lied to the American people about, you can, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan? I personally do not believe that he knowingly lied, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. I think that uh, when the thing was uh, cooked up, um, the plan included a great expansion of Medicaid. And I am fortunate and blessed to live in the state of South Carolina, where uh, Governor Nikki Haley promised that Medicaid would not be expanded. And what people need to look back to <clears throat> is uh, the decision uh, by the Supreme Court that said that Obamacare was constitutional because uh, it was uh, a form of taxation, and Congress gets to write uh, tax laws. But there were two parts to that decision. And the second part of that decision included uh, the part about the government, the federal government, forcing the states to expand their Medicaid roles. And the Supreme Court said that that could not be done. And therein lies the one of the possible ways that uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, will fall apart. And that is why you're seeing these changes now, That uh, because the numbers are not going to add up. If they couldn't force a certain number of people into Medicaid, then the insurance companies were not going to be able to afford to cover all the rest of the people that were forced into the program. But they've known this for quite some time, and they didn't come forward and say to the American people, we, we have to make major adjustments. Well, we have to make major adjustments, and uh, what the American people are having to realize now is that these uh, these adjustments are going to uh, include a, a reset of what you can expect. The American uh, people have um, enjoyed and benefited from a fabulous health care program that is expensive, and to provide that across the board uh, is difficult and problematic. So there is going to have to be some shifting of the wealth. Uh, redistribution of wealth to make it possible for everybody to enjoy that. Okay, well, what, you, what that, you just what you just re- described is socialism. Yeah, in a way, socialism, and uh, and uh, yes, it is. And are you endorsing that? That's why. So that am I enforcing it? No. Are you endorsing the idea of redistributing the wealth? Uh, no, no, no. I'm okay. not endorsing any of it. I'm just. I'm just explaining how I see what's happening. Yes. And uh, and people say, well, look, you can you can say, no, you don't want something, but you got to come up with an alternative. What is the alternative? The alternative is to expand the free market approach to everything. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm doing in my practice. Now, tell us, tell us what myself, you're doing. What we're doing is we're unhooking from the, the insurance industry gradually. We can't overnight just dump everybody. But we're gradually unhooking ourselves from that. And the first thing that happened was that uh, through the uh, through the mandates and through the encouragement and enticement of government to get doctors onto an electronic health record, something that was supposed to make everything more efficient and safe and and far uh, and uh, error free, it's turning out that uh, this electronic health record is is turning into an open door for intrusion on people's privacy. So we've decided to unhook our computer in our office from the Internet so we cannot be hacked into. And if anybody uh, doesn't understand the the risks and dangers present from the government now with all the NSA revelations, um, they just need to wake up and do that. Mm -hmm. 
So um, are you going to a, a cash-only basis? We are going to a, a fee-for-service, cash, uh, credit, checks, payment at the time of service. And when you do that, when you, uh, when you no longer have to file insurance, when you don't have to file secondaries, when you don't have to hire the people to do these things, you can charge uh, a far lower fee for your services. Our standard office fee now is $45 for a visit. $45 is less than a cell phone bill, and it's less than a trip to the beauty parlor. What, what was it when you were going through the system? Well, the standard office fee through the system is $68, 68 mm-hmm. to $78. Mm-hmm. So we don't, have to, we don't have to hire the personnel to work the insurance system, plus the, the maintenance agreement for the, for the computer software for our office. The maintenance agreement alone was $6,000 a year. And now, one, now we no longer have to bear that expense, and those are all savings <clears throat> that we can pass on to the patients. Okay, so if your if your patient uh, um, your patients uh, won't need well, this is yeah, this is where this gets to be complicated because well, it is, it is complicated, and I can see where you're going with it. And the and the, the reason it works for us is because I am a primary care general practice doctor. Mm-hmm. And the things that I provide are relatively inexpensive. They're affordable. Now, if a person has to have an uh, appendectomy or they have to have their hernia fixed, that's a different story. Mm-hmm. And for that, you should have insurance. But that brings up the point that what's happened all along is that, that, that health insurance hasn't been health insurance for the longest time. It's been a health benefit that's been paid for largely by employers and now people are realizing just how expensive this thing is. Mm-hmm. And if the employers are going, if the employers are going to change the work rules and push these people off uh, their benefit packages, then they're either going to have to pick it up themselves or go alone. And so now everybody's going, "Oh my God, look how expensive this is! These premiums are going up." Yeah, they're going up, and they're they're going up because of um, first of all, uh, a lot of people being brought into the system who who weren't insured, who have pre existing conditions. Or are drug addicts, alcoholics, whatever, and they're they're going to they're going to get subsidized insurance. The taxpayers are going to pay for it, and then on top of that, the the everybody else is going to have to pay higher premiums for the insurance companies to provide all this wonderful insurance to all these other people. And that's the redistribution of the wealth. That's right. That's the shifting of the wealth. That's the socialist part of the whole thing. That's the plan. Now I got I got to say this and again mm-hmm. not, I'm on becoming across as an Obama fan. Remember that what the liberals wanted was not Obamacare. They did not want the Affordable Care Act. What did the liberals want? The liberals wanted single payer. They wanted Medicare for all. And they didn't get it. And I do listen to the liberal press and read it and it, and they are as put out with uh, with Obama as the whole situation is as, um, as some of the Republicans are and some of the conservatives so is the, the is the danger listen, some of the Democrats some of the Democrats are starting to bail from this thing right they're, okay, they're taking heat from it so is the danger that the conservatives make so much noise about how horrible Obamacare is and its rollout that they end up saying Let's just scrap the whole thing and go to a single payer nationalistic health care plan. There are a lot of people who believe that that <clears throat> might come to pass. There are people, but we don't know. We we don't know the future. We can't predict the future. Mm-hmm. But there are people who speculate that that might be how it turns out. There are people who speculate that that was that that's by design. I mm-hmm. can't imagine that they're smart enough to design it, but. In other that's words, entirely that, possible that that's how it turns out. In other words, uh, they 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 deliberately made the rollout so bad that it would fail, so that yeah. the, so that the solution would be to go what they to go to what they wanted in the first place. Right. Mm-hmm. But still, the whole thing the whole thing that that sticks in people's craw the the whole thing that's so distasteful to people of freedom and liberty is the fact that the government can force you and penalize you for buying a product. From the private industry, it just it just bothers people so much. I think that's what the true conservative Tea Party, liberty minded people find most objectionable about the whole thing. Well, if they can require us to buy private insurance from a private insurance company, why can't they require us to buy a car from General Motors since the government 
you know, <laughs> invested in General Motors. Why can't they do that? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And and the, and the insurance companies are going to are going to still they're going initially they're going to make out on this thing. They've got it figured out in their favor. Now, this is not the first time that government has forced people to buy insurance. You look at the rules on automobile insurance, and in South Carolina, you have to have a certain amount of liability insurance. The state government forces you to buy $25,000 worth of insurance from a private industry to cover your liability for the privilege of riding a car in the state of South Carolina. I would imagine in some states it's much, much higher. But that's only but required if you're using. Reporting. That's only required if you're driving. If you're not a driver, you don't have to do it. True. But but True. under Obamacare, if you're healthy yeah. and you don't go to the doctors, you don't go to the hospitals. You still have to buy it. Oh, absolutely. They said, yeah, it's it's anal- it's, it's somewhat analogous to, uh, to the insurance requirements for cars. But it's it's if you're living, if you have, if you choose to privilege to live, you have to buy the insurance. Mm-hmm. So. And it's going to make people criminal, it's going to turn them into criminals for not participating in the system. Right. Now, I've got to, I want to hit on something real quick because I want people to see this. I saw a uh, YouTube um, two weeks ago from a Dr. David Belk, B-E-L-K, out of San Francisco, and his YouTube explanation of why health care costs what it costs is fabulous. It is eye-opening. Everybody deserves to go to this website and watch this 54-minute video and get this explanation. It's, his website is called truecostofhealthcare.org, O-R-G, and his name is David Belk. And he, it's almost an expose. It deserves to be on 60 Minutes because he really does put together why things cost what they cost in health care. He explains why there's a $100 aspirin tablet in a hospital and why things cost the way they do. So if people want to get an understanding and a handle on the cost of health care, they need to watch that video. Truecostofhealthcare.org? Right. All right. And if you can't find it there, uh, Google Dr. David Belk. What, what is the danger of, of um, concentrated uh, medical records in the hands of the federal government? Okay. Um, good question. Um, Richard Nixon went after a guy named Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg was the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers. Daniel Ellsberg was described by Richard Nixon as the most dangerous man in the country. And when Richard Nixon wanted to discredit Daniel Ellsberg, he sent the burglars into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to pilfer the records and release them to discredit him. That's why our medical records are, are should be sacrosanct. They should not be available online. Um, this stuff will be used against us. Absolutely. Is it uh, is it unreasonable to foresee a day that that a political regime could have such tight control of the federal government that? Health care decisions could be made clandestinely in Washington by political operatives based on a patient's political leanings? I can't conceive of it going that far, uh, hopefully not in our lifetimes. But listen, we're already talking about the right to keep and bear arms being um, evaluated based on a person seeking health care for psychiatric issues. Now, how many of the listeners out there have gone to the doctor's office because they're anxious over some situation or a parent has died and they've been on antidepressants for a short period of time? There's there's millions. There's millions of people taking Prozac and Xanax and all sorts of things. Everybody, Every one of those people could be deemed ineligible to own and keep and bear firearms. Are, and all are, sorts of other things. Are doctors going to be deputized as as basically government agents? Well, they're not going to be deputized, but they may be forced to turn over information about people. And uh, I have in my in my practice practice experience uh, had the FBI come 
to my office and ask interviews of people who are patients who are looking for security clearances to work at a local uh, nuclear facility in near Aiken, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to be deputized, but well, when I, these I, are not national security letters. These are just FBI agents right. coming wanting background checked information, which, by the way, I refuse to give. And, and I use that word uh, in uh, reference to what the banking laws have done to bankers, because bankers are now required to snitch on their customers. If you go into your mm-hmm. bank and you withdraw $10,000 of your own money, the banker is required to file a suspicious activity report, because if the banker doesn't do it, the banker himself or herself is now at risk of being prosecuted under the Patriot Act. Well, uh, and that that makes me think of one thing, and that's uh, there are certain illnesses, certain contagious diseases that doctors are required to report to the public health people in the community they practice. But to my knowledge, there's no there's no uh, penalty, there's no fine or criminal penalty for not doing it. It's just something you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to report certain things that might be passed on to other people. But it's no stretch of imagination to say that that they might require any treatment of significant depression or anxiety or such to to have to be report, have to be reported mm-hmm. because you might be keeping people safe so that's no stretch doctor have you have you considered the possibility that there is something in the immigration bill that uh, is coming up to be voted on in the house that it is connected to obamacare um i i haven't heard on any on any forum anywhere any and i, and I scour okay. Well, let me throw things on the internet. Yeah. Let me throw this right. out to you. There, in the Senate immigration bill, there are numerous references to Homeland Security establishing some type of biometric photo identification tool, which mm-hmm. sounds like a biometric ID card. And right. and so, and then you're also going to have this e-verify system that every single American will have to be approved by Homeland Security. To have a job, including the existing job you have. You, everybody will have to be vetted by Homeland Security under the Senate bill. Mm-hmm. If you combine the E-Verify and a, a biometric ID card with Obamacare, are we looking at, at a Orwellian system that uh, if, if you aren't biometrically scanned and brought into the system, you're going to be denied health care? Um, tough to say, tough to say, mm-hmm. but back to, back to, uh, my uh, pride about being a South Carolinian. Remember, South Carolina was one of the five states that fought, uh, the national ID. Mm-hmm. The ID that, uh, your driver's license, the, you know, the parameters of yes. the driver's license would be dictated by the national government. But it's in the South Senate Carolina bill. It's in, like crazy. But well, it's in the Senate immigration bill. They're bringing it back. It's in its- well, then we're going to we're we're going to fight it again. We're going to fight it again. And and uh, listen, there's a there are a large number of people who are very unhappy with Lindsey Graham in South Carolina, very unhappy with him, and he's apparently one of the ringleaders on the immigration reform stuff. So yes, he is, and he's also uh, one know. of the pushers of this biometric ID card. Bring it on! More ammo for those people that want to see Lindsey Graham go. Yeah, he and Chucky Schumer. <laughs> No, no, really. He and Chucky Schumer are working together on this biometric ID card idea. They've been doing this for years. And uh, well, then, then we have a free press uh, and a free uh, media that, like you, we're going to help get this information out and to whomever is listening to it. Hey, what, pay what, attention. What, one last question: Do you do you think Obamacare yeah. is going to spur growth in international medical tourism? It already has. I mean, the healthcare system, the the way that things are outpriced has already done that. I have one or two patients a year from South Carolina fly to uh, Southern California across the border into Mexico and get some kind of gastric surgery for uh, weight reduction. People go to Mexico all the time now for dental care. Um, I've had a patient go to Thailand or India or someplace to have a hip replacement. Sure. Yeah, Panama, because Costa Rica. Basically... Yeah, for for a fraction, basically for a fraction more than the cost of the airline ticket, 
And I'm careful to ask them what their experience is like. Was the place clean? Were the people intelligent? How were you treated? Uh, all that. And they are they're very impressed with the care they get. So, That's right. Uh, of I've, course, they are flying on their own when they do it. Yes. But uh, these people are paying out of pocket for these things that that they can't afford. Yes. And, of course, uh, someday that will be a, ter- a terrorist activity. <laughs> To leave the country well, you're, seeking you're, medical well, care. You're traveling, out, you're traveling outside the country, absolutely. That's right. Uh, that? The IRS and Homeland Security will have to question you. Well, my guest, uh, Dr. Mike Wasowski, uh general yes. physician from Aiken, South Carolina. Doctor, thank you. Appreciate you stopping by True News. Thank you. Let me, uh, thank you for letting me be on the show, Rick. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, this is True News. Patience is a godly virtue, which has practical ramifications in a believer's everyday life. Dr. Stanley explains in today's Moment with Charles Stanley. You want to make more timely, wise, profitable decisions in your life? Then develop patience. You want to develop strong, loving, lasting relationships in your life? Develop your patience. You want to have the favor of God in your daily life and relationships to other people? Develop patience. You want to become the person that God wants you to be? To achieve the things that God wants you to achieve in life? And do you want to learn to be happy with yourself? Then you must develop patience. It demands time, energy, and effort. And the question you have to ask is this. Do I value this awesome, powerful trait enough to give it the time, the energy, and the effort to make it a part of my life? And Father, we pray that you'll make us wise enough and that we'll have a desire strong enough to be willing to lay aside old habits, to be willing to have you change whatever needs to be changed, that you'll sand and sift and sculpture in our life, shaping us in the likeness of your Son, making us valuable servants of yours, a comfort to others, a strength to others, an encouragement to others. For your glory and your honor, in Jesus' name, amen. And the first step toward being shaped to resemble Jesus is accepting his gift of salvation from the penalty of sin. Learn more when you click All Things Are New at InTouch.org. Well, on a positive note, there was a lot of feedback to my interview yesterday with Pastor A.J. White regarding his book, Faith of Our Grandfathers. Interestingly, the topic that garnered the most interest is the subject of baptism. A lot of listeners asked for more programs and discussions on this sacrament. I'm really encouraged by the responses because it confirms to me that so many of you are genuinely hungry and thirsty for the living water of Jesus Christ. Here's a quote from the second Helvetic Confession. But the principal thing that God promises in all the sacraments and to which all the godly in all ages direct their attention some call it the substance and matter of the sacraments, is Christ the Savior, by whom all the elect are circumcised without hands through the Holy Spirit and are washed from all their sins. Now to be baptized in the name of Christ is to be enrolled, entered, and received into the covenant and family, and so into the inheritance of the sons of God to be cleansed also from the filthiness of sins and to be granted the manifold grace of God. 